This is a lesson on sound interference in standing waves in the simple harmonic motion in waves unit. In a prior lesson in waves, I had talked about wave interference. Waves have a wavelength, which we know is related to the speed, and any difference in amplitude or frequency determines how two waves interfere and add with each other. We add them very simply with superposition, and what we focused on was perfectly constructive or perfectly destructive interference. Uh, in those situations, we looked at the path length difference. What is the difference in actual distance traveled of one wave to another to a spot? And that's true for sound waves. They will have a physical distance they traveled because they, have, they need a physical medium to move through. When we look at interference of standing waves, we're looking at a very specific situation when two sets of waves of equal amplitude and wavelength. So these two waves, both the same energy, both the same frequency and wavelength, they pass through each other in opposite directions. And you can see that down here, wave one and wave two. Wave one is moving to the left, wave two is moving to the right. When they pass through each other, they're going to amplify each other in some situations and they're going to cancel each other out in other situations. This should be very intuitive after what we know about interference of waves is that some resultant is going to be some maximum value and then at some point later it goes to zero. When they pass through each other and it's a half a wavelength off, they will cancel each other out. When they're a full wavelength or lined up with one another, they will amplify each other. And then we will also have regions in between. So when I think about this, uh, what, oh, let me finish this here. It's going to create stable regions of constructive and destructive interference called anti-nodes and nodes. So let's look at this a little bit more in detail with the nodes and the anti-nodes. Uh, this girl over on the end of a string is uh, waving it up and down. And of course, uh, the string can only, or rope, whatever it is, can move up and down, right? Each one of these points along the string just move up and down and up and down. And they will reach a maximum value, have something in between, and then fall to zero and a negative maximum value. And she's going to wave it at a regular frequency. Here's her hand over here. We can see that in a certain situation, when she starts, the wave will move in one direction. There's the incident wave. And what happens is when the wave hits the other end, wherever it's attached here, it will reflect back. And that may be something that you've experienced, it will reflect back at you. So we get another wave on the same string in the opposite direction. So we have two waves, same amplitude, same frequency, heading towards each other. So we're going to see this a situation where each of the points on the wave are going to cancel up and down except in those stable regions the nodes and anti-nodes where there will be constructive or destructive interference all of the time so when there is destructive interference all of the time we get a node and that node will stay in the same spot and you can see in this final version when I take multiple pictures of that string vibrating up and down and up and up up and down this position will never move. We call that the node. Over here, we can see if the girl starts waving her hand and creating waves faster or much faster, we get this interference happening more frequently. This one has no nodes on it. This one has one node on it, and this one has two nodes on it outside of the ends, which can also be considered nodes. So that's how a standing wave works. Let's look a little bit more particularly at the wavelength of these waves and how they relate to the nodes and anti-nodes. So, so this is also what we call resonance. There's this amplification of waves. Standing waves are a case of resonance. And what it, we're doing is we're trapping a wave in a bit of medium. It's traveling in, and because it's trapped, it's going to vibrate back and forth. If the size of the enclosure is a multiple of the wavelength, the addition of the wave with itself causes an amplification of the amplitude. Uh, we will see this with open and closed ended musical instruments when I get th to them in a little bit. But just focusing on this, the waves oscillate up and down but do not seem to move. Okay. 
We did this with the cello problem on another lesson where we had a string attached to a wooden instrument and the lowest vibration that can happen is just where uh, the endpoints make up half a wavelength so that the wavelength is two times the length, 2L. When we increase frequency, we can see that we can get a standing wave of half that size in the same length. And so we see lambda 2 is a different value. Lambda 2 equals L in that situation. When we raise the frequency within that same distance, we're going to get another anti-node and another node. And we see that the wavelength decreases again and this frequency changes as well. So that the size of the wave that can be trapped in a single distance depends on multiples of that wavelength within that length. Dividing that length into equal parts and that relating to the wavelengths of those waves in there. Uh, so this is what we call harmonics. The first harmonic here where there's just no nodes and it oscillates up and down, that's called the first harmonic or the fundamental frequency. More often in books you will see it called the fundamental frequency or F1 for n equals 1. You'll see that in a second. This is the lowest possible frequency for a standing wave on a medium is the first harmonic fundamental frequency. On this picture, notice the ends are also called nodes, and I'm not too particular about that. Obviously, if it's a string, it has two nodes on the end, um, but more often in books, they will ask how many nodes outside of the ends are there, and so you can see that increases as the harmonics go up. The larger harmonics are overtones. When a musical instrument creates a sound, not only is there the fundamental frequency, but there's also these harmonics going on. And you can see that the composite wave, when I add all of those waves together, the composite wave will make a specific sound. And that's unique to each individual piano or clarinet or human being. And we can see that harmonics go all the way up. This is a piano. There's a C. There's another C. There's the G, there's another C, right? There's, um, when I do multiples or different fractions of these, that's what makes the scale. Different harmonics interfering make different instruments, this composite wave. And when you get composite waves, for instance, when this peak lines up with this peak in maybe an orchestra, you get this much greater interference going on and it fills the space more, the energy is larger, and that's the experience of a live orchestra. The first problem that I put together for us in this lesson is draw a standing wave. So no calculations necessarily, just can we picture it? It says draw a picture of a standing wave that is three wavelengths long. How many nodes, not including the endpoints, are there and how many anti-nodes? So three wavelengths long, and this is how I think about it. I'm going to create a wave. Here's a wave, and there's one wavelength. And then this isn't going to be perfect. I get two wavelengths and then three wavelengths. Okay. Uh, and I'll attach it at the ends. Those are the two ends. And now I have three wavelengths. One, two, three. Those three. One, two, three. Three waves. Uh, if it's a standing wave, I know that uh, it will have nodes at where the equilibrium position is. So I'm going to just draw the mirror image of this around the equilibrium position. And again, this isn't perfect, but you can see what's going on here that the nodes are appearing out of here. All of these are the nodes. Remember, it's attached on the end or whatever's going on at the end, if it's an open end on a tube, for instance. But the nodes in between, I see one, two, three, four, five. So to answer nodes, there's five nodes. And when I look at the anti-nodes, those are the peaks. I see one, two, three, four, five, six anti-nodes. And so that's, can you draw a picture? Can you visualize what's going on with the standing wave? Can you see a wavelength, how the wavelength relates to the length here? So I would say the wavelength equals one third the length in this situation, right? We can get that feeling of 
how does the wave fit in that spot? Uh, an application of this that I will put in your mind for a seed for if and when you get to that is quantum mechanics and the allowable radii for an electron to be typically found at. At that level, a piece of particle moving as fast as it does has a wavelength, the de Broglie wavelength, and that de Broglie wavelength, the allowable ones, are, uh, are standing waves so that electron around an atom becomes a standing wave with itself. It's amazing to think about that this single electron is interfering with itself, but you're okay with that on a string, right? If this little girl was standing at the end and then it reflects back, it's the same wave interfering with itself. This happens in the atom with an electron in allowable orbits. So that's where that idea comes from. I'm really anchoring that idea here with standing waves and this idea of nodes and the allowable wavelength within the contained distance that we're looking at. So now that I've looked at standing waves, let's get a little bit more particular picture about the frequencies that arise because of that. And so we have, uh, this is from Cut and Alan Johnson. This is the guitar picture that I had a previous problem. And also this picture here to show how the different uh, partials are uh, created, right? That there's a single frequency, the fundamental frequency, you can see it going up and down, but there's also this third harmonic that's also being created as the wave is being created for the fundamental frequency. So that's where partials and harmonics come. How do we find this frequency one or frequency two or frequency three? Because we know that the wavelength is related to the length and we know the velocity is related to the frequency, we can say this, right? Velocity equals lambda times f. And I know lambda equals 2L in this situation, or lambda equals L in this situation, or lambda equals uh, 2 thirds L in this situation. You can see that it depends on the length. So when I plug that sort of generalization into this equation and solve for the frequency, that's how this equation comes about. It's not a magical equation that you necessarily have to remember. It should make sense. Um, but it makes it easier to think about that each frequency, each harmonic, depends on some ratio of the velocity over 2L and times some integer n, some positive integer n. So we can see in this situation the frequency is going to be 1 times V over 2L. In this situation, the second frequency, the second harmonic, is going to be 2 times actually the first harmonic, right? The same ratio gets put down here, and we just call that F1. So what I want to note here is that is this is for waves on strings. So that's why I have a picture of a guitar here, a banjo, a ukulele, a cello, anything, a violin, anything in there that has a string that's attached on the two ends. Both ends are fixed. That's a very specific situation in which this equation is true. And you just put in the integer values, one, two, three, to get the different harmonics. So I picked a banjo for us to work on, the plucked banjo string. A banjo player plucks the middle of an open string. The 12 gauge wire is attached at two points, 26.5 inches apart. The wave speed is measured to be 480 meters per second. Okay, so they give me a length, L equals 26.5 inches. And if you're familiar, uh, there is 2.2 centimeters in one inch. So when I convert that to centimeters, I get 58.3 centimeters. So I have the length. Um, the wave speed is measured to be 480. So it seems like I have L and V, so I could find some frequencies. It says, where are the nodes of the standing wave in the string? So we covered this problem before, but just to remind you, it's like the guitar on the previous page. The lowest frequency, if you just pluck the center, it's going to oscillate up and down. And this would be the first harmonic or the fundamental frequency. So the nodes here just at the end where it's attached. 
Uh, and even then it might say zero nodes because there's no nodes in the middle here. There's only one anti-node. So what is the wavelength of the vibrating string? So we know the wavelength, this is half of the wavelength. L equals a half of the wavelength. A full wavelength would mean to extend it all the way out. Um, so the wavelength is two times L. When I look at this again, this is how we derive the, um, uh, this equation here. The fundamental frequency, if I solve this for frequency I get is V of the wave divided by the lambda, which I know is V divided by 2L in this situation. And in this, we'll know that this is just the first, the fundamental frequency. So when I take these numbers, 480, divided by 2, and then I'm going to convert this to meters. So 58 centimeters is 0.583 meters. And when I run this through the calculator, I get a fundamental frequency of 823.33 hertz. Okay. Uh, we could calculate higher harmonics, but they didn't ask for it. And that's how you find the fundamental frequency. You could have just plugged one into this equation and notice it would have gotten the same thing. We'll look more particularly on these examples. Um, the next musical instrument I'm introducing is um, Air Columns 1. And what I'm going to note is that this is an, uh, a tube that is open at both ends. So what we know about instruments like this, organ pipes are like this, flutes are like this, oboes are like this, such that basically it's closed at both ends is the same as open at both ends. We can see at the length here, we have a different arrangement. The, the wave, because there's no place to anchor the wave, this is just a sound wave going through, there's no anchoring like with a string, that the ends are open and the node will be in the center for the fundamental frequency. And we can see that this is half of a wavelength, just with the, um, if it's attached at both ends, it's the same as open at both ends, okay? So what we end up getting is the same equation, N V over two L. Uh, I like this picture because it shows how the standing wave interferes and is created in the space of that tube. Here's the same length, right? This is the same length. The ends act as open, the, the, where anti-nodes will be, and you see that there are two nodes here. Again, uh, we can see that there's a whole wave, right? We go from here to here, right? Now we can fit a whole wave in here. We start at the peak, go down, and then come back up again. So that's one wave. I, I was hoping you'd catch that. This may look like a whole wave to you, like there's two halves here. But what we want is we start at the top, go down, follow one of these lines. See, this is only half the wavelength. This is a whole wavelength. And so each successive frequency that creates a standing wave in that length of tube, whatever it is, uh, the wavelength is related to the length. And we can just increase by a factor of n, and that will give us our frequencies. So the example I picked for this is just an open tube. You may do this in a lab situation. It says sound moves through a 0.672 meter long open tube, um, open at both ends on a day when the speed of sound is 344 meters per second. Okay, so maybe it's a little bit hotter that day or something. What is the fundamental frequency? What is the frequency of its second harmonic? Uh, so fundamental frequency, uh, F1, where N equals 1, N equals 1. The second harmonic is going to be N equals 2. The fundamental frequency is 1. Uh, we'll take the velocity and divide by 2 times the length. So this is a very plug and chug, straightforward example of this. When you run these numbers through your calculator, you get 255.952 hertz. Okay. So that's the fundamental frequency of just an open tube. You could get a tube over at the home improvement store and do this sort of example. Uh, part B asks, what is the second harmonic? Well, I'm going to note that the second harmonic is going to be two times the first harmonic, right? V times divided by two L. 
Well, I'm not going to do that calculation over again. I just did it. So I'll just take 2 times 255.952, and that equals 511.905 hertz. So twice the first. And that's how you would use that equation. Pretty straightforward. So the first situation is when the tube is open at both ends. The other situation that we worry about, air columns two, is when it's closed at one end, which is in the example of a trumpet or a clarinet, where the musician's lips, like with a trumpet, vibrate on one end and so it's closed. That creates a node at one end. And because it's open at the other, we're going to have an anti-node down there. And notice how it changes the relationship between the length and the wavelength of that wave is now it's a quarter of a wave. And when we increase the harmonic, when we increase the harmonic, uh, the first overtone they call it, we have to go to the next anti-node, which is a half of a wavelength. So you get the quarter of a wavelength plus a half a wavelength and gives you three quarters of a wavelength. You add another half a wavelength, you get five quarters of a wavelength. And so in this situation, notice it's a different equation where we have a fourth down in the bottom, right? We have a four down here. And then also we have odd integers. Not all of the integers, but the odd integers. These two equations for the both ends open and one end open are very similar to one another, but they're not exact. So watch out for this in your problems when you're working the problems. I've chosen an easy example, a more difficult example in order to look at this situation. The first is a tuba. A wind instrument, such as a tuba, has a fundamental fre frequency of 32 hertz. It is closed at one end. What are its first three overtones? The overtones of a real tuba are more complex than this example because it is a tapered tube. So we're going to assume that it's just a, uh, an equal radius tube throughout, but we know that's not true. Um, it's closed at one end, right? It's a tuba, so the person's mouth is at one end, and it's open at the other. So we'll have an anti-node here. Because we know it's closed at one end, we have to use this equation with the 4 in it and then the odd integers. We know that F1 is 32 hertz. And I'm going to note that that means you know that is V over 4L. Whatever that quantity is, we have 1 times V over 4L. And so any subsequent one, any subsequent uh, overtone is going to be the N value times F1. So when I run that through the calculator, F2, actually I'm going to call this F3, right? This is the the first overtone is going to be when n equals 3, when I plug 3 in there. So I get 3 times f1, which is 3 times 32, which is 96 hertz. That will be the first um, overtone. The second overtone happens at 5, so we're going to get uh, 5 times the 32. That equals 160 hertz. Uh, each one of these, notice, adds uh, the difference of these, which is 64. 64 hertz here, 64 hertz here. So F7 is going to be this plus 64 hertz, which, um, or 7 times 32, uh, which is 224 hertz. Those are the first three overtones of the fundamental frequency for this tuba or whatever wind instrument it is. I'm also going to note here that there are going to be beat frequencies of each one of these with each other, which creates that rich volume, that rich, the richness of the sound that comes out of a tuba is not just the fundamental frequency or whatever frequency you're, you have it tuned at, but also all of the other fundamentals that are capable beyond that. Very rich tone. The last problem I chose is a much more difficult one. I've seen this done in labs before, and that's why I'm including it, so that you're familiar with how to do this calculation if you see it in lab. A 512 hertz tuning fork is struck and placed next to a tube with a movable piston. So what we're doing is here's the tube, and we're going to assume it's a uniform tube all the way down, and it has some length 
um, some adjustable length, right? There's a piston in here and I'll call, I'll shade it in and here's the um, piston. You can move the pist back, piston back and forth. So what we're going to do is we're going to move the piston and the tuning fork is down here vibrating and I'll put the vibrating um, signal here. So that's vibrating. And the sound goes into the tube, bounces and comes back and creates a standing wave in there for particular lengths, right? Uh, whatever this length is, L. So the piston, the piston is slid down the pipe and resonance is reached when the piston is 515.5 centimeters from the open end. So um, I'll call this LA. I'm not going to call it one or whatever because I don't know which frequency is. I'll just say that the first length is length A. And uh, length, at length A, I get 515 centimeters. And I get some sort of um, harmonic of the frequency of 512. I don't know what N value that is, but I know that there is... A resonance happening the standing wave it gets really loud when you do this in lab you, it's very distinguished you can tell exactly when this happens so that will that's the first situation it says the next resonance is reached when the piston is 82.5 so we move it closer and we get another harmonic of uh, I don't know what the n value is but at 82.5 centimeters I get of the frequency of 512 has some sort of harmonic there as well. And so what we're seeing is instead of having a single length with different frequencies that work in there, if I solve this equation for length, I get NV over 4 times the frequency, whatever that is. And for each, for a frequency, if I just call it F, for a frequency, I can get different n values and that corresponds to different lengths. If I want a certain frequency, I can figure out what length that needs to be. So um, what happens here though is I don't know what n is. Notice that I don't know what n is at all. They don't tell me. It could be 352. I don't know what it is. What I do know is that there are a relationship. It says the next resonance, the next resonance. And I notice when I go up in frequency, I have an N plus 2. So I'm going to note that NB has to be equal to NA minus 2, right? The difference between each one of these is 2. So I know that NB has to be NA minus 2. So when I... Plug this in, I can get an LA and LB. So that's what I'm going to do here. I know LA and LB, and I can plug those in, and I really don't care about the values. I think you could do this if you really wanted to by uh, plugging in one equation, plugging in the other equation, and then um, uh, doing some substitution. But I don't know the N values. So let me do this trick. This is a pretty clever trick and why I'm showing you this problem is if I do LA minus LB, those are both values and I can find the difference between them. That's why I really care about is the difference between them. Well, that'll be NAV over 4F. And remember, V is the same. It's the same wave for both of these situations. They're going to have the same velocity and the same uh, frequency. So NAV over 4F minus nb which i know is na minus 2 times the velocity over 4 times the frequency right this is the length of b and where i saw nb in there i plugged in na minus 2 do some algebra here you can see that i have a positive na and a negative na over times v over 4f so those cancel so la minus lb has to equal a positive 2v over 4f or v over 2f. It's that simple in that situation. But we had to do um, this uh, property here. Remember, that's true. If they're successive, they differ by 2. And also, um, I subtracted them. So that lets me do a little bit slicker algebra. So if I want to solve for the velocity, it says what's the speed of sound in the tube? I'm going to say the velocity equals 2 times the frequency times this LA minus LB. 
and I can plug in numbers for that. 2 times 512, um, and then we have 115.5 minus 82.5. When I subtract that, that's 33, and actually I want to make that into meters. This is 512 hertz, so I'm going to do meters. 1.155 minus 0.825. That's 33 centimeters or 0.33 meters, and when I run this through the calculator, I get the velocity is 337.92 meters per second. And why am I okay with that value? If I calculated, if I did something wrong here and I calculated a different number, I actually know about what value I expect the speed of sound to be. In air is, I know on 20 degree uh, Celsius day, that is 343 meters per second. And here I got 338 meters per second. So I know I'm right in the right ballpark, the right range in there for calculating this number. The next part asks, how far from the open end will the piston cause the next mode of residence? When I talked about the properties of this wave, um, I said that the next increase would be a half of a wa wavelength. I can go back to that slide. Here's a fourth lambda. We get another half of a wavelength, half of a wavelength, another half of a wavelength. So when I look at this, I know that I'm going to get another LA plus LB. The next one will be the same distance over. That will be the same. So LA minus LB will equal a half of the wavelength. And so the next distance will be LB minus a half the wavelength. Remember, we're reducing the distance. So it'll be 82.5 minus 33, which is 49.5 centimeters. That's when we expect the next resonance to happen for this frequency wave with this wavelength in there.